Welcome, everybody. I'm Chris Harbard. And I'm Mary Sia. <laughs> and welcome to the latest of our um, webinars, our online speaker series from Southwest Wings. Today, I'd like to welcome Gillian Cowles. Here's Gillian. Hi, Gillian. Hello. Gillian is, is an expert in things that I would once upon a time have called creepy crawlies. <laughs> but I think one needs to be a little more precise. So these are arachnids we'll be talking about today, which includes, I have to say, some I'm not fond of, which is spiders. <gasps> but I do find them all fascinating. And it isn't just spiders amongst the arachnids. There's scorpions, there's daddy long legs, there's mites, um, there's ticks, all things that we really know and love. <laughs> but if you don't know and love them, you may still not know and love them, but I'm sure after Gillian's talk you'll be totally fascinated. And I have to say, you're going to revel in the amazing macro photographs that Gillian takes that will give us a little look into the uh, behaviour and interaction of these arachnid species. Carry on, Gillian. Can we just All right. a little oh. reminder that um, we're holding questions till the end. And there's a place for you to enter your questions, or you can raise your hand, and we'll we'll see you guys at the end. And uh, no more further ado, we will turn it over to Ms. Okay. Lynn. Thank you very much. I'm gonna click on share screen now, and then okay. And what we want to do is slideshow and from the beginning. All right. Wow, well, load it quickly this time. Okay, so um, this is titled Sharing, Caring, and Thievery, Arachnid Behavior and Interactions. So let's get started. First of all, what is an arachnid? Well, it's an arthropod, which means it has an exoskeleton. That means it has to molt in order to grow. And it has multi-segmented legs and body. So among the arthropods are insects, crustaceans that include lobsters, crabs, and animals like this little roly-poly, centipedes, millipedes, and chelicerates. Now, what is a chelicerate? Well, chelicerates are named for this structure right here. Chelicerates have two chelicera. And in the case of the scorpion, each chelicera consists of a fixed and movable finger. This is a fixed finger. This is the movable finger. So among the chelicerates are horseshoe crabs, arachnids, and uh, possibly sea spiders. Now, chelicera work more or less like little hands in that they're able to cut up the food, at least in, with a scorpion, they work like little hands. So each fixed and movable finger can cut up this katydid into little pieces. And as the scorpion masticates the food, it can introduce uh, digestive enzymes and liquefy that katydid and then slurp down the pre-digested liquefied food. So here's a better view of that little chelicera at work cutting up this katydid. So these chelicera, you'll notice it looks almost like a little leg in some ways. Um, from a developmental standpoint, they are sort of like little legs, but from a functional standpoint, they're like jaws. For spiders, each chelicera consists of a naked fang. And the, Fangs are hollow and have a hole at the tip so that they can introduce venom using their fangs. So among the arachnids are spiders. This is the spider in case you didn't notice it, the butterfly kind of <clears throat> distracts you in this photo. Scorpions, pseudoscorpions, vinegaroons, also known as uropigids, schizomids, Amblypigids, also known as tailless whip scorpions. Palpigrades, which are also known as micro whip scorpions. And this little palpigrade is only about a millimeter long, including the flagellum, the tail. 
for a scale, this palpigrate was photographed on black construction paper. And these are the fibers of the paper. So that gives you an idea how tiny these things are. Harvestmen, solifuges. These are also known as wind spiders or camel spiders. And the ticks and mites. Now ticks and mites used to be in a single group but in recent years, they've been split out into two groups. The parasitiformes include ticks and some mites such as opilioacarids. And then the acariformes uh, include things like giant desert velvet mites, red uh, spider mites, and a lot of other what you would consider typical looking mites. And the last group is recinulaids which are a very tiny order of arachnids that barely come up into the United States. They occur in the very southern tip of Texas and are very rarely seen. Okay, let's start with the green link spider. Now these spiders are frequently seen as they ambush pollinators who are visiting flowers, such as this one has captured a little bombalia fly. Green link spiders are found throughout the tropics and subtropics. There are many species of green link spiders. Um, you can frequently find them on things like prickly pear flowers in the spring as they're waiting to ambush insects. We have two species of green link spiders that occur here in southern Arizona, Pusetia viridens, which is uh, highly variable in color, and Pusetia longipalpus, which is generally green like this. Now, green link spiders actively defend their egg sacs. This is a mother green link spider, and this is her egg sac. And she stays with the egg sac to defend it against all kinds of threats. Everything from grasshoppers and ants and beetles will try to devour those eggs. But in addition, there can be vertebrate threats, such as uh, birds and rodents that might try to steal that egg sac because spider eggs are very nutritious and tasty. So these green link spiders have a very special way of defending their egg sacs against a vertebrate predator. This is a green link spider when it first sees a threat approaching. It's, and you'll notice that the line at the bottom of its, its body is basically straight right across here. But as the threat comes closer, which is the tips of these black forceps, you'll notice it tips its, the front half of the body, the cephalothorax, it tips it upwards a little bit. It extends the fangs forwards a little bit, and it sort of separates these chelicera. So it angles them out and separates them, and then it actually can squirt venom out. You'll see this little line here. This fang is still squirting venom in this picture. This fang has already discharged its venom, and you can see this moisture at the tip of the uh, forceps. This is a little bit closer photo of this. He, this one here is actively backing up as it's spraying the venom. So the legs, you can see that the legs are in motion here. And this little stream of venom is overshooting the forceps. And this one is in the act of squirting the forceps. So here you can see the venom as it's hitting the forceps. Now this was first observed in the 1940s uh, by an American serviceman who is kneeling down, checking the back of his motorcycle. And all of a sudden he got this terrible pain in his eye, something squirted him in the eye. He had to go and seek medical care for his eye. He, it was so painful, he couldn't see out of it, he couldn't drive. And they went back and checked at the back of the motorcycle and there was a green link spider that was collected from the back of the motorcycle. So that was the, the first indication that these things could squirt uh, several inches, in fact. So it managed to spray him right in the eye and um, this is analogous to what spitting cobras can do. No other spiders are known to use this kind of defense, just green link spiders. Of course, there are quite a few species of those around the world. Now, green link spiders stay near their egg sac until the babies emerge and disperse. If the mother disappears during the time that the eggs are incubating, 
the chance of success for the youngsters uh, coming out of the egg sac and dispersing drops from roughly 75% down to about 10% success rate. So the mother's active defense of the egg sac really does help a lot. When the babies first emerge from the egg sac, they hang around for a few days until they molt. You can see the little exuvia, the exoskeletons of the ones that have molted. And then a few days later, when the conditions are right, they stand on tiptoe on some vegetation, release a little strand of silk and go ballooning off to a new life. So this business of defending an egg sac is actually one of the most basic kinds of maternal care of young that you'll see in many, many species of arachnids. Now let's look at another kind of arachnid, a vinegaroon. They're named vinegaroons because they can spray almost pure acetic acid out of their rear end. You see, I can hardly see the little advanced thing here. Okay, um, and so this little knob at the base of their flagellum is called the pygidium, and it works like a revolving gun turret, so they can aim the spray in any direction. The spray is used purely for defensive capabilities. It is not used to capture prey. Vinegarons go through an extremely long courtship, which includes a dancing stage. The male is on the right, the female is on the left, and the male holds these long antenniform legs of the female in his chalicerate as he dances with her. The dancing stage can last for several hours. At the end of that stage, he starts to generate a spermatophore. This is the male and this is the female. She's embracing his abdomen, but he's still holding the tips of her antenniform legs in his chalicerate. At the end of about three hours, he deposits a spermatophore on the ground and she picks up the sperm packets with her gonopore. And then he turns around and embraces her. This is a male here as he helps to press in the contents of the sperm packets. Now the entire courtship of vinegarons takes place during 12 to 16 hours on average. So it's a huge investment on the part of the vinegaron, but that's just the start. The courtship takes place in late summer or early fall. And in the late fall, the female vinegaron digs a maternity chamber and she seals herself in that chamber and she'll stay there for at least seven months without eating during that time. In the spring, she deposits big eggs into this uh, membranous pouch that she incubates under her abdomen. And about five weeks later, the babies hatch and they climb onto their mother's back where they undergo further development. They have these little sucker pads on their feet and their bodies have a lot of fat and protein stores, so they can undergo further development just sitting there on their mother's back. Sometimes a mother produces her own weight in babies. At the end of the five weeks, they have to molt in order to go to the next life stage. When they first molt, they're almost colorless. So here's some ba a baby dropping down out of its exoskeleton, old larval exoskeleton, and when they first molt, they're almost colorless, but over time, their pedipalps go from, to become uh, pink and eventually become red. And their uh, body color gets darker colored until it's almost black. About a month after molting, the mother vinegaroon starts going out of the burrow and sometimes she captures food and brings it back for the babies. And in this particular case, the mother vinegaroon had caught a large, cricket and she brought it down to the burrow and deposited it and the babies just swarmed over that cricket and started tearing it apart. Once the babies emerge from the burrow, the mother actually shares food that she captures. So here she is masticating a cricket, turning it into mush and the little baby vinegaroon can reach right between her pedipalps and grab chunks of that cricket. Sometimes the babies will swarm around the mother and be grabbing chunks of cricket away. I've seen vinegaroons continue to feed their babies for four months uh, after the babies emerge from the burrow. So they emerge from the burrow at, during the summer rains, usually in July. And I've seen the mother of vinegaroons in captivity at least continue to feed babies into November, which is really incredible. So this ex extended maternal care of young gives these babies a tremendous 
advantage in survival because they're really quite tiny. They have no venom. Being able to catch prey is difficult for them. And so sharing food gives them a better chance of survival. And eventually these vinegrins are more likely to survive and reach maturity and pass on these altruistic genes of their mother to the next generation. So really natural selection doesn't say, oh, you have to be a bird or a mammal to care for young. Uh, even an arachnid cares for young because natural selection says, hey, if it works, why not? Okay. Here's another uh, example of some social behavior in an arachnid. This is Anolosimos, Arizona. It's a tiny relative of the black widow. You can see that they're quite tiny because this one's carrying a fruit fly. That gives you some scale. This is the mother giving a fruit fly to her babies. And here's a, two clusters of babies feeding on fruit flies. As the babies get older, they're able to capture prey themselves. And as soon as one baby detects prey, it signals in the web for its siblings to come and help it capture the prey. So here's a bunch of siblings, and eventually all of them get to share in the prey because they can uh, cooperatively kill the prey. So these spiders are considered to be subsocial because they stay in the web only until they're almost mature, and then they disperse. So each colony is made up of only the offspring from a single mother spider. So these colonies only reach about 30 spiders in size. However, in the tropics, there's another species of Anolosomos, which is Anolosomos eximius, in which the colonies are permanent. They go from generation to generation to generation, and the colonies can reach as uh, large a size as 50,000 spiders in a colony. Here's something of interest. There's a little kleptoparasite that lives in the webs of these, of these uh, Anolosomos. And this is Ranzovius clavicornis. It's a mirrored bug that actually feeds on the prey of the spiders. And it's a kleptoparasite because it's stealing from the spiders. Okay, let's look at some other cooperative killing of prey. This is a dictinid spider. And dictinids are fly specialists. Now, to give you an idea of scale, this same fly is seen in this next photo, and that the entire web of that dictinid is smaller than the tip of my finger. So what these spiders do is that they build webs at the tips of branches and on grass stalks and on sunny rocks and windowsills where flies tend to land. So if you were to look at this uh, grass stalk and look at this little area here, you would see two spiders living here. This is the male and this is a female. They're an adult mated pair and they cooperatively help uh, each other by killing prey. This is Stictina calcarata and these frequently live on windowsills and sunny rocks where flies like to bask. And you can see, by the way, some pointy pedipalps on this male and that's a good a little um, easily recognized characteristic that I'm going to point out in the next two slides. So here's a male. Once again, you can see that little pointy pedipalp here and a female, and they are cooperatively killing this little bombelian fly that had uh, landed on the sunny rock and shared in the prey. Once again, you can see that little pointy pedipalp of the male. So this pair of dictinid spiders are very, very tiny. And it was quite a struggle for them to overcome this fly, even working together. So um, if they were working alone, I doubt that they would have been able to capture this fly. Uh, so cooperative killing of prey is something that is of great uh, benefit to these particular spiders. Another example of cooperative killing of prey might be seen in these uh, fulcet spiders. This male had killed this Centauridae scorpion, and he shared it with the female. Sometimes fulcets have even been observed cooperatively killing prey, uh, where several adult fulcets band together and help. And so this is not predicated on a family group. This is cooperative killing of prey between two adults of the same species. Now let's look at some arachnid interactions with 
uh, species that are not of their own type. So this is a carrion beetle with mites on it. These mites are not feeding on the carrion beetle. Instead, they are riding on the carrion beetle. So this is re referred to as hitchhiking or foracy. I offered this carrion beetle some nice moist carrion, which was uh, some moist cat food. And immediately she started to chow down on that cat food. And all the little mites dove head first into that carrion and started to feed right alongside her. However, as soon as she stopped feeding, they all climbed back on board and not a single mite was left behind. Now these little mites are very finely attuned to the carrion beetle. And that's because to get from one little carcass to another, their little short legs would never carry them to such ephemeral and uh, spatially rare resources. But this beetle can detect and fly to little carcasses very readily. Now, when the carrion beetles find a carcass, a male-female pair of carrion beetles will bury it. So if it's a little rodent or a little bird, they'll prepare the carcass and then actually bury it. And then they lay their eggs on that carcass. And these little mites at that point will dismount and mature, and they'll lay their eggs there. And at first it was thought, my goodness, they'll be competing for the uh, food resource with the larva of the carrion beetle. That doesn't benefit the carrion beetle at all. But in fact, what they do is they probably predate and hunt down fly maggots and other kinds of beetle larva that might eat that carrion that would compete with that resource with the beetle's own offspring. So they probably repay the carrion beetle for the rides that they get by eliminating competitors um, for that food resource that the beetle's larva needs. Another kind of arachnid that's famous for hitchhiking is uh, pseudoscorpions. And pseudoscorpions, this one is, uh, has hitchhiked a ride on the stratiomeid fly, which is getting a little drink of water along a stream bed. <clears throat> and this little uh, pseudoscorpion had grabbed the legs of the fly to get a ride. These ones are riding on a cerambicid beetle. Excuse me, let me get a little drink of water. So they can ride from one tree to another on this beetle and get there very readily, which their tiny little legs would no way get them from one tree to another. This particular pseudoscorpion is very common on, in the low desert of Arizona. You can find it under almost any rock. And you'll notice the length of its pedipalps. But there's another species, <clears throat> which is a sister species, which has very long pedipalps. This is found in only two caves in the entire world. That's uh, Colossal Cave and Arkenstone Cave. These long pedipalps are a sign of it being a troglobite because um, in caves where animals become uh, obligate cave dwellers, they sometimes develop elongated appendages and the other two things that they do is lose pigment and lose their eyes. So this particular cave Sicurina spider has lost its pigment. You can see it's almost clear. And it's lost its eyes. Now in the same cave as this particular little cave Sicurina, there's another Sicurina that has reduced pigment but hasn't lost it all the way and still has eyes. This one is probably um, hunting in the twilight zone of the cave whereas the eyeless one probably hunts down in the deeper depths of the cave. These populations are genetically isolated, but you can see that speciation is already taking place in this tiny one little cave. Uh, here's another cave species of spider. This is a Darkinetta species, a tiny little thing that's only about two millimeters long, uh, very almost uh, opalescent looking. The only other Darkinettas are found in Texas. So this is a isolated population in a single little cave. You can also find bat ticks, such as Carius eumatensis, palpigrades, Sithelcinas. These are tiny little harvestmen. This thing is only about two millimeters long. 
found in that same cave that had the blind cave spider. And also in that same cave is a pseudo-Eurotinus species. Now the cave I'm talking about is at about 3,000 feet elevation. It's low, relatively low desert. It's got uh, creosotes and, and uh, saguaros and polyverdes. Pseudo-Eurotinus is a relic, a relic species that's left over from when this area was cooler and moister, when all of Southern Arizona was much more cool and moist. And now Pseudoeuroctinus are found mainly on mountaintops and, or, or at least higher elevations like the Santa Rita's, um, and also in these caves that have a little more moisture and uh, less severe conditions. So they're, they're isolated populations in these caves. One other kind of spider found in that same cave is Loxosceles sabina. The only population of these known in the entire world is in this small cave. And you can see it has captured a pseudo, pseudo uh scorpion. These are related to the famous brown recluse and also related to our Loxosceles arizonica. Now this kind of spider is found in caves, but also all over the surface and in your garage and probably in your house. This does have the uh, very unusual venom called sphingomyelinase D that uh, can cause tissue damage and necrosis. So when you're cleaning out your garage or something, always wear gloves because these are very common in our area. And another cave species that you might find are Skytodes. These are called spitting spiders. They have a high dome cephalothorax to accommodate a huge glue gland. And when they first encounter prey, what they do is they squirt out two streams of a mixture of glue and silk. And as soon as it's squirted out, it starts to contract. So it fastens an animal very snugly. Here you can see one in the act of squirting out this glue and silk. And you can see how tiny their little fangs are. The entire squirting sequence takes only about 25 milliseconds, which is 1 40th of a second. The fangs oscillate back and forth. You can see the pattern of moisture on this rock as this spitting spider was chasing after this cricket. Uh, the fangs were oscillating back and forth, leaving this uh, pattern of moisture. And the oscillation rate is over 800 hertz, which means over 800 back and forth cycles for each fang in the space of one second. So this is very difficult to capture on film or you know, in a, in a photo. Um, a closer look at the fangs with an electron microscope gives you an idea of their size. So this is 100 microns from here to there. The fang, I measured it to be about 70 microns long. And instead of having a hole at the tip, it has this open tapered funnel. And 70 microns is about uh, the average width of a human hair. So these really are very tiny fangs. As a consequence, when they give the killing bite, they have to do it in a thin area of the cuticle, such as a leg joint. And you can see how that cricket is very securely fastened down with that glue. And then it cleans off its feet and goes off and carries the prey off to feed on it somewhere. Now, what is the basis of all this uh, arthropod life in a cave? I've barely scratched the surface, by the way. There's all kinds of beetles and bugs and, and all kinds of invertebrates living in that cave. But, but what powers all that life? Well, first of all, you have things like cave crickets, which make good prey, and sosids. These are called book lice. And these book lice are really important because what they do is they feed on fungus that grows on bat guano. The bat guano is really the key thing in a cave because that forms the basis for these to be able to get food. And in turn, these, these provide a food resource for all kinds of other predators. So even though populations in caves may be genetically isolated. The cave is not isolated from all outside uh, factors. For instance, if groundwater pumping was 
to be excessive or long-term drought was to occur, the uh, humidity in that cave might be modified and that might affect populations. Or if bats were to uh, disappear due to white nose syndrome or because of lack of insect prey to support their populations, there wouldn't be the bat guano and all these other organisms in the cave would probably disappear. Now let's go to a black widow web. So we've looked at a cave as a single little environment. Now we're gonna look at even a smaller ecosystem, a black widow web. So everyone knows what a black widow looks like. And black widows capture large prey terrestrial organisms a lot of times. They'll carry them up close to their, their little uh, silk shelter to feed on them. This is a grasshopper that this black widow had captured. And you'll notice that she has a, an egg sac up here in her silk retreat. And then two other egg sacs have been discarded. These are probably old ones where the babies had already emerged. And this is probably her current egg sac right here. Now here's another black widow web. And you'll notice something really odd about this. The two egg sacs of the black widow are out at the periphery of her web instead of in her silk retreat. And there are four other little spiders in her web. You can see one, two, three, four. Those little spiders are Argerodes Pluto, and these are obligate kleptoparasites in the webs of black widows. So while they're in the web of the black widow, now and then they'll glean some small prey item that gets caught in the web that the black widow doesn't care about. Like for example, this little moth was captured in the web and this little Argerodes Pluto is gleaning that prey. But what Argerodes Pluto really, really like to eat are baby black widows. And what they do is they steal the black widow egg sac, chew a little hole in it, and extract baby black widows one by one and feed on them. So this is a female Argerodes Pluto, another adult female, and a little adult male. And they're all sharing the food source that they have stolen. And the Baby black widows, by the way, are white when they first uh, emerge from the black widow egg sac. So here's the little male getting seconds after he'd eaten that first baby black widow. And what he does is he reaches into that little hole with his chelicerate and he extracts one baby black widow at a time and feeds on it. As a consequence, the other baby black widows developing in this egg sac are not compromised in their development. They're able to complete their uh, embryonic development and emerge from that egg sac just fine. So here's a female Argerodes Pluto feeding on a baby black widow. And it made me wonder why are they feeding on black widow babies what would be the advantage to that? Because most Argerodes throughout the world are kleptoparasites in the webs of orb weavers. Now we have several orb weavers in Arizona and I thought about why are Argerodes never found living in these orb webs? And let's take a look at that. We have, for example, our GP trifasciata, which is a nice big orb weaver. And typically, Argerodes around the world that live in the tropics, they home in on fairly large orb weavers, such as an RGOP, so that they can steal nice large prey items from the RGOP. They don't steal the egg sacs, they steal prey. But when you look at what RGOP does, when she produces an egg sac, she goes off in some little hidden spot and makes a single egg sac, and then she hangs out until she dies. Here's Neoscona wahakensis. This is another common orb weaver in our area, but you'll only notice these really as large spiders in the latter half of the monsoon season. So the first half of the monsoon season, these are quite small, and it's only in August and into September that they're large enough to have large webs and be capturing large prey. 
And once again, these Neoscona, when they're ready to lay their eggs, they go off in some spot and produce the egg sac in a nice hidden spot somewhere else than their web. So there'd only be a window of about four to six weeks in which uh, Argerodes could be stealing prey from her web and then would only be able to steal at most one egg sac from her under ideal conditions. Metapyra is one more orb weaver that we have that's very common, but these are fairly small orb weavers, so they wouldn't provide a very big uh, prey base for them. And when they produce egg sacs, they string them up in a line like this with lots and lots of silk, which would be very difficult for an Argerodes to steal. So as a consequence, Argerodes Pluto have switched to stealing egg sacs of the black widows instead of prey, and they feed on the baby black widows. This is a good example of a baby black widow. The baby black widows, as I mentioned, can still undergo uh, further development in the egg sac, and quite a few of them do emerge successfully. Uh, here's a Argerodes Pluto still feeding from the egg sac as other baby black widows are actually coming out of the egg sac to disperse. So at least 70 baby black widows emerged successfully from this egg sac and dispersed. But what they do when they disperse is they hit the ground running, or rather the web running. They, it only takes them about two hours to come out of the egg sac and leave the mother's web. They, they actually just run away as quickly as they can. And I think it's because of the presence of the Argerodes Pluto in the web, because I did see an Argerodes Pluto briefly pursue some baby black widows as they were dispersing from the egg sac. And the babies easily outrun them, but it would make sense for them to disperse away from there pretty quickly. Um, this is in strong contrast to the baby green link spiders that hang around on the egg sac for several days before they disperse. So I call this precocious dispersal, and I believe that this is an example of co-evolution of the host spider with the presence of the kleptoparasitic spiders in its web. The stealing incident is triggered by the black widow wrapping prey out away from her silk retreat. So here's a skinny black widow who had produced an egg sac not too long before. She's very hungry. She's wrapping this big beetle out away from her silk retreat. And at that point, the little Argerodes goes into action. She makes a beeline to the silk retreat, cuts down the egg sac, and starts to take it out of the silk uh, retreat. She moves it off to one side first, and then she transports it little by little by attaching silk in one area and then cutting the other silk lines and moving it in increments away from the Black Widow uh, silk, uh, tubular retreat where she would keep her egg sac. Now, one of the things that really intrigued me is this is typically how they move the egg sac. But in one case, I saw an Argerodes carry the stolen egg sac out to the mouth of the silk retreat and then just push it out and let it drop on the floor of the porch. She then dropped down on a drag line, immediately found it on the floor of the porch and then suspended it several inches below the black widow web where she could feed on that egg sac in complete safety from, you know, the black widow was not gonna discover her down there. This had all the appearance of uh, planning so a lot of this is uh, instinctive behavior, but you do wonder how much they have to learn and figure out that might be some sort of cognitive function. In the background here, you can see some light colored objects. This uh, little Argerodi is carrying this egg sac over to this section of the web where she has her own egg sacs. So they seem to know where they can uh, carry a Black Widow egg sac, where the Black Widow is unlikely to go. Now, once she's fed from that Black Widow egg sac for uh, a week to two weeks, she becomes extremely fat and she's ready to produce her own egg sac. So she starts out with this little cone-shaped object, and then she tips it on its side and starts to extrude eggs into it. 
And it takes her only about a minute to, to lay all of her eggs. She just pushes them out all at once. You can see this deep dimple in the back of her abdomen as she's pushing out her eggs. And this is the volume of eggs that that little spider produced. So this is a really big investment on the part of this little female. She then proceeds to wrap it with flocculent silk. And then after that with fine silk, layer after layer after layer of fine silk. And it takes her about four hours to build that egg sac, at which time she is exhausted. And she rests with these long, long front legs stretched out across the egg sac as she guards that egg sac. Now they start out looking like this before laying their eggs. And by the time they're done, they look almost deflated or emaciated. So at that point, the little Argerotes female is ready to go steal another Black Widow egg sac. So when they steal this egg sac, this will give you some scale because this uh, Black Widow web was on an old bicycle that I had parked on my front porch. This is the front of the silk retreat of the Black Widow. And the little Argerotes had just taken that egg sac out of that silk retreat and she's transporting it. And the, this uh, bicycle tire will give you some scale about how far she's taken it. This is only about a minute after she's taken it out of that silk retreat. You can see a little black something at the bottom of this egg sac. We're gonna come back to that in a few minutes. The Black Widow periodically rushes back to her silk retreat. And I think that she's checking, uh, trying to protect her egg sac, but she can't be in two places at once. And sure enough, she got back there a little too late. The little Argerotes had already taken the egg sac away from where the Black Widow seemed to have any awareness of it. So these little Argerotes know right where to carry these egg sacs where they can be safe from discovery from the Black Widow. However, I will say that the Black Widow, if she happens to discover a stolen egg sac, she does carry it back to her retreat. I saw this happen at once after a summer monsoon rain had uh, done quite a bit of damage to the Black Widow web. And the Black Widow then uh, was repairing her web and she encountered a stolen egg sac. She carried it back to her silk retreat and within two days the Argerotes had stolen it back from her. It was really, it was easy to recognize that egg sac because it had a little dent in it from the summer monsoon storm. It had taken a little bit of a beating. Uh, so this is really interesting. One of the reasons why I think that these uh, Argerotes Pluto also find it useful to have switched to Black Widow egg sacs instead of prey in orb weaver webs is that a big Black Widow like this, she produced nine egg sacs over the course of a single summer. And these Black Widows can live two or three years. And their webs are pretty much permanent. In other words, she doesn't take down a web and rebuild a new one every day the way that an orb weaver might do. So there's a lot of benefits to having switched to these uh, egg sacs as a food resource because it's a continuous production, unlike the orb weavers that basically produce one egg sac and then die. Um, she's producing more egg sacs as long as there's more food available to her. So nine egg sacs in a single season and out of those nine, the Argerotes managed to steal seven of them. So it's a really great, a uh, food resource for them. By morning, this little Argerotes had carried it all the way down here. So you can see the top of the silk retreat over here and she had carried it down here and you can see her little own little egg sac down here. So she's starting to feed on it and you can see her feeding on a little embryonic uh, black widow here that she had extracted from there. Now that little black something that I pointed out is this little wasp. This is Philolema latrodecti, which is an egg parasitoid wasp that specializes on the eggs of comb-footed spiders, such as the black widow. So that's a closer view of this little wasp. It has competition though. This fly, Pseudogarix signatus, is an egg predator as well. So what it does is it lays its eggs on the outside of the black widow egg sac. It's Little maggots tunnel through that silk and then they devour the eggs of the Black Widow. 
So the Argerodes Pluto has these two other uh, arthropods as competitors for those eggs. Plus, it has its own egg parasitoid wasp to contend with. This is Arachnopteromalus dazies, and I won't say that name again because it's too hard for me, but it was attempting to land on this Argerodes Pluto egg sac, and the little Argerodes was frantically trying to shoo it away. Sometimes it would grab it and fling it. Other times it would have to chase it around on the egg sac. So it was actively defending its egg sac against these little egg parasitoid wasps. And after about 40 minutes of watching this emaciated little spider frantically trying to defend her egg sac, I collected the little wasp so that I could get it identified. Another predator that might be encountered in the web is a pirate spider. So I found seven pirate spiders over the course of a summer in the web of this black widow that I was studying. And pirate spiders, what they do is they hunt and kill other spiders, specifically cone-footed spiders like the black widow and also orb weavers. But I don't know whether this, these pirate spiders would have preferentially been hunting the Argerodes Pluto or the black widow. If I had left them in there, I would have been able to find out, but I didn't really want to leave them in there because uh, I wanted to find out what was going on with the Argerodes Pluto. Let's look at one other pair of comb-footed spiders and their kleptoparasites that I found here in Southern Arizona. This is Tadaren sisyphoides, a cousin of the black widow. And instead of making a tubular silk retreat, she ties together several leaves or uses a single leaf as a silk retreat. If you were to twist around this leaf, there she is guarding her egg sac in her little leaf retreat. Now in her web, I was finding Neospintherus babokivari, which is another kind of kleptoparasitic spider. This is the egg sac of a Neospintherus babokivari, by the way. At rest, they look like a little bit of detritus in the web. In the Tadaran sisyphoides webs, I was finding as many as 40 or more of these Neospintherus babokivari. The females look like this, and the males look like this with these odd protuberances on their heads. But the thing that I wanted to show you with this male is you notice how it has two long legs on the far side of its body, but on the near side of the body, those two legs are missing. Here are the stumps. And I believe that this is from inter intraspecific aggression of the Neospintherus. Neospinthrus are aggressive with other spiders, at least at times, because the only other time that they'd been documented in Arizona were as solitary araniophage, in other words, solitary spider hunters in the webs of Philippinella. So instead of being group living, what they were doing were being solitary, they'd infiltrate the webs of Philippinella and they'd actually kill and eat these little spiders. These are very small spiders. And what they do is they are um, facultatively communal. So in good conditions, they'll set up webs adjacent to each other, almost like an apartment building where each spider has its own little web, but it's connected in a small area with a bunch of other little apartments, if you will. The Neospinthrus babakivari prey upon these small spiders. They're small, they completely lack venom, so they're probably very easy prey for the Neospinthrus. But in the webs of Tadarin, I was finding them as primarily kleptoparasites gleaning prey from the webs of the Tadarin. And I saw absolutely no evidence whatsoever that they were killing and eating the resident Tadarin uh, spider, the, the big comb-footed spider that they were living in the web of. They were, the Tadaran cystophoides webs were along a stream edge where the, there was very abundant prey. And I believe that these little Neospinthrus were able to live in large numbers in those webs, basically using the web as a source of 
prey capture and simply gleaning a lot of prey from it. In this case, a, a juvenile one is feeding on an ant. Uh, also in the Tadarum webs, I saw a Philolema latrodecti, which I believe was scouting for an egg sac to lay its uh, eggs in. And you'll notice this odd spindle-shaped cocoon to the side of this Tadarin uh, refuge. I found a number of these in the Tadarin webs. And these are the cocoons of Zatipoda, which is an ichneumonid wasp. And these wasps are uh, parasitoids that kill a spider after, well, what the wasp does is it lays an egg on the abdomen of the spider and it's larva, this is a wasp larva feeding on a spider. It feeds on it until it's ready to pupate at which time it kills a spider and then it pupates. So I, I think that these uh, Zatipoda were probably using the Neospintherus kleptoparasites as a host because I was finding Tadarin host spiders alive and well in the same webs as those uh, wasp cocoons. So in the same area as the Tadarin cisophoides, there was a, there were a number of black widow webs. And you can see the cottonwood leaves, just like what you saw in the Tadarin web. Here's a cottonwood leaf with a bent stem and use that as reference because that's the same leaf there with the bent stem. But I'm focusing a little bit in front here. And each of these white arrows is pointing to a little Neospintherus babokivari spider also living in the black widow web. And in her web was also a little Argerodes pluto, one little lone Argerodes pluto guarding her egg sac. But you will notice this Argerodes pluto is missing those two very long front legs. And my suspicion is, is that the presence of the Neospintherus is why she's missing those legs. I think that the Neospintherus are aggressive with other spiders and sometimes the spiders lose their legs. In the webs that lacked Neospintherus, I saw no leg loss in Argerodes. So that's strong circumstantial evidence that the Neospintherus were uh, competing directly and possibly aggressive with these little Argerodes pluto. The Argerodes pluto are obligate uh, kleptoparasites in the webs of only the black widows, whereas the Neospintherus kleptoparasites can live as either solitary spider hunters going after the Philippinella, or they can live in the Tadarin webs, or they can live in the black widow webs. So the Neospintherus are far less specialized than this Argerodes pluto, which is only found in the webs of black widows. So let's take a quick look at the black widow to wrap up. So a single black widow web could potentially have Argerodes pluto, several of them, Neospintherus bavocavery, Philolema latrodecti, as an egg parasitoid wasp, Pseudogaurex signatus as an egg predator, this other little parasitoid wasp that would be going after the Argerodes pluto eggs, Zatipoda, which would be an ectoparasite, uh, actually ectoparasitoid, and Mimetus, which would be a pirate spider. So the thing to remember about this is that these are highly complex ecosystems. There are a lot of players that have a lot of different effects on each other. Uh, for example, the pirate spiders might be actually beneficial to the black widow if they bump off the little Argerodes pluto. Who knows? So this brings us to the idea of the interconnectedness of life. Um, this picture makes me think of Indra's net, which was a metaphor that appeared in third century India. And Indra's net was a spider web that was hung with dewdrops. And each and every strand of the silk connected all the universe 
And in each and every dewdrop was reflected the entire universe. And so whether it's a cave or a spider web, these little ecosystems are tied in with the world beyond. And that in turn is tied in with, with the world beyond that. So I think of this as a really beautiful metaphor as uh, that, yeah, we, we have our own little bubble, if you will, but we're still tied in with the rest of the world and we're all in this together. So I hope that we take good care of our planet and have a future. That's the end of this talk, but if you're interested in learning more about arachnids of the Southwest and their natural history book out called Amazing Arachnids, published by Princeton University Press. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian. That was absolutely fascinating. I am going to have nightmares tonight. I can assure you that. <laughs> And another thing, hey, I've got flesh-eating spiders in my garage. I'm never getting the car out again. Never. <laughs> well, so, I thought uh, I should mention that because they, they can be, you know, significant if, they, if you get bitten. I mean, usually it's not a big deal, but once in a while it is. Yeah. So please remember we have the question and answer feature if you have any questions. Um, I have one, Julian. Right at the beginning, you were talking about the egg sacs being... Um, uh, a food source, and you describe them as tasty. Uh, what do they taste of? <laughs> I've never tasted them, but you know, so many animals want to eat those eggs and do eat the eggs that I have to just use my powers of deduction and think that they must taste pretty good for a lot of animals. Um, they, they are um, a food resource for ants, crickets, grasshoppers, and rodents that we're pretty sure of that will uh, eat spider eggs. So, so yeah, they must be pretty tasty for them at least. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm not tasting one, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're nutritionally, you know, full of protein and, you know, lots of good food value in there. So, so yeah, I imagine that they'd be a real, um, really excellent food resource. And seeing that those little Argeretes Pluto, I mean, whenever they, manage to score a black widow egg sac within a, 10 days to two weeks that those Argerodi Pluto were ready to produce their own eggs. Mm. So it was pretty good nutrition for them at least. Yeah. Wonderful. So Any, Julian, I have a little, I, all of this is happening with the, the black widow. There's so much competition around her and what is the benefit to her? Ah, that's a good question. You know, when I think about it, like it, there might not be a benefit to her. Uh, mm -hmm. She might be just a, you know, um, a resource as far as the Argeretes Pluto is concerned. Uh, however, you never know. Maybe the pirate spiders preferentially pick off the Argeretes Pluto, get what they need and then leave. Uh, if that were the case, it would benefit the Black Widow because it would direct a predator towards uh, something other than herself, you know? Mm. So, so there might be an indirect benefit. That's something that would have to uh, be looked at in a future year if I, if I have another nice little setup on my porch to observe. Um, <laughs> I'd like to say that nobody else has ever observed, um, gone through and done any natural history work with these Argerodes Pluto or with the Neospinthrus in the Tadaran webs. That was the first time that Neospinthrus had ever been documented as group living in the web of anything. They'd always been um, documented as solitary spider hunters. So, so it's really interesting that they have this plasticity in their, in their behavior repertoire that they can live at, in groups in a web of a comb-footed spider. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you say, <Yeah>. amazing. <laughs> you know, the business of the Argerodes Pluto knowing where to put these egg sacs where the Black Widow was unlikely to discover them. Um, you know, it, it just really makes you wonder what the cognitive 
capabilities are of these little spiders. Um, pound for pound, they might be the smartest little critter on, their, on the planet. <laughs> we should be really thankful that they don't live a really long time, that they don't have opposable thumbs, and that they're not very large. You know, they're <laughs> tiny little spiders, because we have a run for the money. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, it looks like we have a couple questions from our participants. Okay. Um, Joyce, Joyce Minks has a question, and Hi. Joyce, you can answer. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Joyce. Okay, um, just fascinating. I knew basically nothing about arachnids before watching this, but have observed the black widow spider in my garage. But I'm wondering how you are able to observe the very, very tiny little creatures. Um, what, do you use special equipment to do that? Um, how, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how you observe all of this so closely. Uh, well, um... Most of it's just done with my eyes, although honestly, the spitting spiders, because their fangs are so tiny and the stream of glue and venom is so small, and that rapid oscillation, 800 hertz, that's 800 cycles back and forth of this tiny, tiny little stream. Even though I've watched spitting spiders capture prey, dozens of times. With my naked eye, I cannot actually see that stream of glue and venom unless I capture it in a still photo. Um, so those still photos that you see where, where you saw the spitting spiders in action as they're squirting out the glue and venom, you can never see that with your naked eye. You have to see it in a photo. So some of my observations are done uh, by way of photos, the same thing goes with those green link spiders squirting. Um, we, in the course of getting them to squirt, I never actually could see the streams of, of uh, venom being squirted out with my own eyes. I had to get the photos before I could see those little streams. So the photos are very helpful. Um, but a lot of times when I'm out looking, I just have to look very closely because those little Argerodes Pluto in the black widow webs look like just a bit of debris hanging in the web during the day. It's, you have to watch and watch and watch before you see something happen. And I spent entire nights watching them, uh, in order to get, record those instances of them stealing black widow egg sacs, which can occur over the space of like one minute, you know? <laughs> so you can spend an entire night to get that one minute uh, event taking place. Okay, thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. And now we're gonna go over to Debbie Brusco, who has a question for us. Okay. Debbie has a question for us. Debbie, would you like to answer, ask your question live? We can read it. Okay. okay. So the question is, has to do with the cave scorpion, pseudo Uh-huh, um, pseudo uh -huh. That's right. Debbie says, we have uh, Eructinus mordax here, and I was curious to why the other species is described pseudo. Oh, well, it's, it's a different genus. Uh, pseudo Eructinus is, um, you know, I'm not a taxonomist, so what differentiates uh, the different genera of scorpions, you would, that's really a question for a taxonomist. I, I have to say I'm not an expert on that. So, so if you want to talk to a, uh, someone who works with the phylogeny and the systematics of a, of a group of animals, that, that would be a better person to ask that question. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, Betsy Hall had a question, which was, which I'd love to know as well. How do you get those amazing photographs? <laughs> okay, well, a lot of times it re requires a helper. And my spouse, Bill Savory, has uh, been drafted many a time. He's the one that has to hold the forceps to harass the green link spiders uh, while I have the camera ready, you know, and, and uh, those were all done out in the wild. No spiders were harmed, by the way. Each spider that, that sprayed, we gave a cricket as a reward so that they got to eat something afterwards. Um, but 
it really does require frequently a second person to help to get those photos. Uh, someone who can um, either harass, you know, wrangle the crickets for those uh, spitting spiders, uh, spray, squirting the glue and silk. I had to have someone wrangle the, the cricket to get it to run towards the spider to uh, get those sequences. So, so yeah, you have to really just keep working at it. And, and a lot of it is just, um, some of it is luck. Uh, a lot of it is practice, 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 because- Camera-wise, Julian, do you have special macro lenses that you yeah, use? Yeah, I do. I use a Canon. I've gone through three different Canon bodies over the space of about uh, 12 years. Uh, it's, a, it's not the top range Canon body. It's like a mid range one. It's a 6D or something like that. Um, I started out with an EOS Rebel body, um, and I use uh, three different macro lenses. The best macro lens for really small stuff is the MPE 65 millimeter, which can only fit on a Canon, I believe. And uh, so, it, so you have to make a commitment to Canon if you're going to get that lens, but that lens is one sweetheart of a lens, although many a person hates that lens because it's quite difficult to work with. It's very heavy, but the optics on it are fantastic. Um, the other lenses I use are 100 millimeter macro lens and also a compact macro lens, sometimes with extension tubes. I use what's called a ring flash, although it's no longer a ring, it's two lights, one on each side, but attach it attaches at the front of the lens and I can program the exposure and I use manual settings for everything. I never have automatic anything settings. Uh, so the focus, the uh, f-stop, all that stuff I set manually. So the best way to get photos is to just practice a lot. Um, to get, uh, for example, the MPE 65 millimeter lens has a very narrow range of focus and the best way to get uh, proficient with that lens is simply to practice with it. It's almost like playing tennis where you click the shutter where you know you're going to be in focus. Um, so you can be moving the lens, you know, forward and backwards and you just get the timing right. So it's, it's like hitting a tennis ball, basically. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Jane. I think that's all of the questions now. That was an absolutely fascinating talk. I think everyone will agree. <laughs> and if uh, anyone Absolutely. tuned in a little late and missed the beginning, this talk will be available a little later in the day. It will be available online from a link on the Southwest Wings website, which is www.swwings.org. So, uh, yeah, that will be available for people to enjoy the amazing inside life of the, these, these fabulous creatures. Yes, with your Thanksgiving dinner. Yes. And thank you so much for having me because um, many of these little creatures are really not appreciated at all. <laughs> and I find them, it's very touching to see how, how much the little mothers, you know, will fiercely put their own lives at risk to defend their, their egg sacs or their babies. It's, it's really it's a real eye opener. So yeah. <laughs> you might have a little more appreciation for these little creatures. Definitely. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> do, sure. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, yours was the first of the holiday series of talks that we're running. There's gonna be two more coming up before the end of the year. On December the 9th, um, Eric Moore, who runs Jay's Bird Balm, will be looking at the ABCs of birding optics. It's on December the 9th. Um, and on December the 30th, Jim Kowik will be looking at plantland, um, grassland plant ID made easy, which um, I certainly am looking forward to because I have problems with identifying plants. I have to say they haven't got feathers and wings and things I have trouble <laughs> with them. So, yep, I'd love to know more about that. So two talks, the optics talk on the 9th of December and the grassland plant identification on the 30th of December, both of those at 11 a.m. in the morning, Arizona time. Yes. And someone's just ordered your book, Jillian. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kennedy. Yeah. Cool. Yes, there's so much more to learn. It's just- I worked on that for 12 years. Uh, I worked on it for 10 years before I even approached uh, 
a publisher with it because I just figured nobody would ever publish a book like that because oh, arachnids no. are so unpopular. But you know, I got oh, very. No. Like, absolutely it's not. absolutely wonderful. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Jillian. Thanks, Jillian. All right, thank you so much for having me. You bet. It's been great. Take good care. And yeah, and everybody bye. have a nice Thanksgiving. Please yep. stay safe. Yes, everybody stay well, be happy. Thanks to everyone who came and enjoyed the talk. Much to be grateful for right now. Yes, a lot to be thankful for. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.